Welcome back to Pen Tester Diaries, a podcast series that aims to take off the hacker hoodie and have a real conversation about this growing profession. In this episode, John Helmus speaks with Harsh Bathra, a pen tester with an appetite for learning and sharing his knowledge. In this episode, they'll examine multi-factor authentication. Let's dig into it. Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Pen Tester Diaries presented by Cobalt.io. Today, I have Hirsch, one of the top core members uh, of the community here at Cobalt. Hirsch, thanks again for uh, taking the time to be on the show today. Thank you, John, for inviting me for the show. Excited yeah. to see what next. Yeah, man. Really, really excited to talk about what you are presenting today. Um, and thanks again, man, for like presenting your own research and sharing it with the community um you know has someone who works in the offensive security community as well you know it's really really good that we always give back to you know our fellow pen testers office of security professionals right so that we share the wealth rather than holding on to it yeah. uh, so you know thanks man for for you know being an advocate to share and to spread the wealth of knowledge because you know if we don't if we're not all learning then you know, it's going to become a, a snowball effect of uh, some bad things. Yeah. So with that go being said, let's go ahead and start jumping into what we're going to be talking about today. So today we're going to be talking about two-factor authentication bypass techniques, which you've actually created a lot of documentation based around. Yeah. So awesome stuff, man. Before we dive into that, though, let's talk about you. It does, it's, not a, it's not a show without talking about who you are. So you know, if you could let the listeners know, who are you? What are you about? What's your expertise and your experience? Yeah, sure. So uh, I am working as a pen tester for a quite while now. It's been like five, six years into the security domain. I started as a normal, uh, you know, hacker tinkering around the various things like games, uh, cheating around the games to see if we can win against our, you know, competitors. And from there, this spark uh, came into the picture for hacking, hacking into the softwares. Then I get into the bug bounty and the pen testing, the penetration testing thing. So the idea is all about to make the world secure, specifically uh, spread the knowledge and learn as much as you can as you go. So currently, I, I majorly work into web application API is mobile and networks so you can say the complete appsec stack is something that i usually do uh, i also do uh, the freelance pen test with the cobalt here at cobalt core uh, where we we again face the same kind of challenges for the various kind of applications uh, including web application apis mobile and network applications so uh, yeah this is a little bit about me that what i do apart from that uh, having a huge interest into the infosec and I, I really love this community because the day i shared about this two factor authentication mind map and the blog as well i received a lot of feedback i received a lot of new things to be added and and people helps a lot to you know modify and shape your uh, whatever the work you are doing over here so this is uh, really a beautiful domain uh, to pursue and to work with so yeah yeah man uh that's awesome i love like how you uh mentioned like you're just like kind of like a tinkerer right you like to like try things out see how they work yeah. and that kind of like led you into uh the career that you're in and i think has like you know the listeners listen in on more of the pen tester diary series they're going to notice that a lot of us pen testers and offensive security professionals we were just curious geeky people and that turned yeah. turned our 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 hobbies into a career, right? And we're fortunate enough yeah. to have it I, turned I, into. I don't feel like your passion turned into the profession, and that's why it interests you most. That ultimately it was your passion at the start. So even if you're, it's your profession right now, you are not bored out of it. Like, and I would say that infosec is the uh, one of the domain that I ex like explored during my even college B Tech uh, journey, even my engineering time. That uh, even I like messed up with a lot of softwares, uh, cloud, machine learning things. But ultimately, I feel that this particular domain is like you have to you know study about a lot of things a lot of programming uh, languages you should you should know like at least how the various technologies are working if you want to be a good pen tester right so it's it's a mix of uh, a lot of things a continuous learning is uh, one of the key factor that plays an important role being a pen tester so it's it's really uh, uh, you know a nice thing to be part of this community yeah uh you're saying continuous learning and i'm and i'm trying to think of like okay how do we illustrate to the the listeners like what does continuous learning mean and that's really out of scope of this conversation because i think that's something that we could talk about a lot but like quantifying it and saying okay continuous learning means you spend this amount of hours every day <laughs> learning something new and uh, i think it's difficult sometimes for even a lot of us in the infosec world 
to really stay out of our comfort zone on a daily basis and learn something new. Yeah, so continuous learning, I would say that uh, just to make sure that your brain doesn't freeze out, right? So like you, once you reach to some particular stage of the pen test, when you know that you are a good web pen test or API or mobile pen tester, then after a certain time, if you stop learning, you are not aware of what is coming new, what is coming latest. And uh, after some time, your knowledge would be somewhat obsolete and it would be really hard to be, you know, again, uh, pick up the pace and learn something again after five, four years or five years. So uh, for the same reason, even I started this thing called Learn 365, where daily I spend like at least one hour to learn something new uh like dig my head around something and i just then post it through the twitter and the github so that even the notes are accessible to the world so that they can also have a summary that okay her is learning something like this maybe we can also go and uh, get a look at it so yeah yeah man yeah if we uh you know you you said to secure the world and there's a there's a, a saying of the world is yours right and it comes from a a, a movie uh, scarface right and the, so the world is yours so now we live in the technology era where you got to secure that world if you want to be a part of it right yeah. um and not just at an offensive security level just at a, at a general level right it, it doesn't matter so um which is great to to mention because that kind of like feeds into our next topic right is talking about two-factor authentication which is becoming a big thing right now um because single factor authentication is doesn't work you and i as yeah. pen testers know it doesn't work you can put security yeah. controls around it but it still doesn't work yeah. right so um to kind of give some uh some context for the listeners that might not know what it is can you give a brief uh introduction to what uh, two-factor authentication is also for the listeners knowing uh, or listening know that it also is commonly known as multi-factor authentication um, but two-factor authentication what is uh what does that mean yeah so to uh, like to put it simply like just let uh, understand what this uh, single factor or like a single authentication is so you are going to a particular website and entering your password now you are able to access it right this is what uh, we all used to do a couple of years back now the new thing uh, is implemented that once you verify your first identity you need to verify one more identity which only you should have access to like maybe uh, you will receive an otp on your phone or maybe you will give your biometrics information to a particular application to just verify your second identity right Right. So when more than one kind of identification comes into the picture, uh, we consider it as a multi-factor authentication. Uh, specifically talking about two-factor authentication, there are two layers of authentication uh, as the word uh, clearly describes it. The first factor could be your password in general or a pen or something like that. Once you enter and verify that, the application say, okay, uh, hey Harsh, you entered the correct password. Now let me just uh, quickly uh, check if you have a correct fingerprint or not. Right Now only I have access to my fingerprint and this totally verifies that okay only Hirsch can access the application so just to make sure the authentication systems are more secure these kind of uh, implementation were impl uh, like implemented uh, across the various kind of application specifically you will see those into the social media application banking sector application and i guess almost every kind of uh, application which uh, somewhat hold the confidential or sensitive information yep so concisely put it's just you know you enter in your password and then you have before you can access your information right you have to you, you have to do one more thing right and a lot of times like like you mentioned with banking banking is the is a big big thing that uses two factor authentication um and i think that's a good topic to base around for this conversation because we all use banking and nobody wants their bank account getting you know hacked into um but when you ha you get into your bank account you put in your password and your email that's the one factor, right? There, there's the first factor of what you use to get in, and then you have to use that something you have, something you um, you already are using, something you know, which is your password. Yeah. Then you have to use something you have, something you are, something you do, right? There's those other factors that you have to put in. So that's where you get that uh, that one time token, or you know, if you access your bank online or on your phone, you a lot of times you can just scan it with your uh, your fingerprint on on your phone to wherever the biometric reader is on your phone um and that's something uh you are right so there's so many different factors right but you have to do that next step before you can get access to your bank account so why is that important so i would say that uh, to you know stop the bad actors i would not uh, you know use the term hackers because often people say that hacking is a crime and obviously hacking is not a crime i would say the bad actors or the bad people uh, who might know your password who might have guessed your password already say uh, you are using a weak password or something like that 
and you are lazy enough or for any reason you are not using a strong password so two factor authentication is like a kind of a protection layer which will help uh, you to be secure even if your uh, the first factor like your password or your pin is beast or uh, attacker is able to brute force it or guess it right uh, so it's it's really essential to implement the two factor authentication so uh, because it will kind of reduce the attacks to a very uh, great extent if the uh, two factor authentication is implemented correctly and this is one of the uh, base factor that we are going to talk about today i guess that uh, why two factor authentication is just not uh, necessary if it's uh, it's not properly implemented it can be insecure and it can be as bizarre as uh, the single factor authentication is yep yeah so it's important because it literally is a second step to keep people out of yeah. uh, out of your stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe, and this would be an interesting way to to ask about your experience without giving divulging any proprietary information. But you know, in your in your time as a pen tester, like. Um, what are some of the potential damages and attack vectors that you that you see? Uh, there has been a lot of attack vectors because uh, the first and foremost thing is the mindset. Whenever you say that the application allows you to put a second factor authentication, the first and the foremost thing is people tend to use the weak password. And this is where things go wrong, right? So uh, you you are trusting the second factor authentication without being uh, you know sure about the first factor. So let's assume your first factor is now compromised, okay? And the attacker is uh, checking your second factor, and by any means possible, the second factor is also not properly implemented, and it can be bypassed right you were still not paying attention to the first factor so the first thing is the mindset which people usually you know don't care about so uh, this don't care mentality is something is the biggest uh, attack vector for the attackers and uh, you know bad actors threat actors across the globe that they use these kind of uh, uh, mentality of the people that if we are using 2fa if we are using OTP based authentication or some uh, kind of authentication, we are totally secure. So this is uh, not the case. This is not always true. Uh, Two-factor authentication can be bypassed. Uh, during my pen testing experience, I have like seen around like five to seven techniques myself to bypass into uh, you know various uh, the two-factor authentication implementation. Uh, some people, uh, some application implement their own two-factor authentication. Some use some third party like say Authy or some other sort of uh, implementation. But again, how you implement things to your code really matters. How you integrate things to your code really matters. Even if you uh, you know miss a single piece, uh, single validation at any particular point, uh, your application is not secure at all. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I know in my own uh, days of pen testing, like I've seen it to where uh, you can capture the OTP, the one-time password, and um, which is the second factor, right? That's that token that you get. Um, something and I guess that's technically something that you have right because you're given yeah. it and yeah. so there's the second factor and uh, I've seen it where you can just enter in arbitrary numbers sometimes into the fields because they don't validate and don't do any kind of checking on it yeah sometimes uh, you simply do the response manipulation like you know uh, the application will check if the OTP is true uh, the value of OTP field or success field is true uh, you will get access to the you know uh, the application even sometimes uh, I have seen attack vectors like you know uh, you are now at the OTP or the 2FA page and you are now just forcefully navigating to say, say for example my account page and push the you know the two-factor authentication now bypassed you are no longer at the 2fa page just because the application is not checking the access controls or the authentication checks properly so there there, there are like a lot of vectors around 2fa uh, 2fa is like according to me is a very big attack surface uh, in itself because it is prone to a lot of attacks uh, yeah yeah i think the big reason too why it's a big attack vector right now too as you mentioned uh, it's or it's a big space like you said it's everybody's being told to use it Right. And, yeah. and rightfully so everyone should use it. But I think because everyone's trying to use it, that what that ha what happens when everyone is trying to do something, that means everyone is also trying to develop a solution for it so that people will use their solution. And yeah. a lot of times those solutions are developed quickly rather than securely. So, yeah. you know, you, you'll see a, a, a third party company say, OK, well, we built this solution in six months when it should have taken us a year. But you should use it so that we can have funding to finish it up for the rest of the year. And before you know it, that uh, that two FA uh, solution is essentially, you know, you're just kind of putting a insecure product into your secure pipeline, right? And 
it can create a yeah, bunch so, of a lot of companies do that like a lot of companies when they go for funding or something like that they want to show that their product is completely a proprietary thing so even they use their own 2fa implementation they will use say uh, say google's or facebook's uh, this code library for sending the otps and sometimes companies use say even four digit of otp which is really an insecure practice to use a four digit otp if you are not implementing correct practices around rate limiting and stuff like that so yeah uh, a lot of uh, it's it's more of a race these days to you know build a software launch something into the market and the people are like not following secure software development life cycle they are like uh, you know security will be when we will be breached they are like keeping security for that time why oh. is just for the listeners in your own opinion why is four digit otps bad and what what would be a good solution outside of a four digit otp yeah so uh, let's say uh, when we talk about four digit otp so uh, the number of combination that an attacker wants to try is between uh, 000 to 9999 right so the kind of uh, the uh, number of brute force attempt uh, attacker wants to make is really less now say let's assume that uh, the application is somehow vulnerable to brute force or no rate limiting attacks where an attacker can basically go about uh, you know sending n number of requests to that particular otp uh, verification parameter now there is a high chance that within 5 minutes within 5 minute maximum and depending upon their uh, com- computational complexities and computational power it can be like less than 1 minute to crack your otp right now the best practice is to use at least six digit otp and that too i suggest not only use digits use the alphanumeric characters so that it it's become more complex to uh, basically bypass uh, the, that kind of restrictions so make it four digits is, is too short because of the amount of brute force attempts that it takes it would take a, it, it would while it is a lot of attempts you know when you put computing power against it it's really not that long versus yeah. you know six it just those two digits can add um some extra depth to uh to the amount of time it would take i mean you can do you know six eight i think eight i, I haven't seen yeah. a place that uses eight yet but yeah that's not saying it's not going to happen right because you know passwords have have had to evolve um over the past you know even in the past five years it's been to where like you know now you have to use phrases and non-dictionary words and things like that so um you know it's 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 interesting how you know all of this stuff can kind of it chains itself together and at the end of the day like if you're implementing you're implementing these secure air quotes kind of uh solutions but they're not secure it's just like security through obscurity kind of thing so that companies can essentially make a buck right they just want to make some money um yeah and it's so with all these techniques that we're talking about right i think you know has you know from pen tester to pen tester you you and me um when you're when you're in the weeds and you're sitting there testing things um it can get you can get really lost in the terminal or in the screen right and you kind of li- lose focus on like the bigger picture and you have done something amazing where you created a uh, 2fa bypass technique mind map that allows or i'm sorry illustrates the attack paths that pen testers can take in order to bypass 2fa um so i'd love for you to talk a moment about that like why did you create it uh what did you have in mind when you created it and then also for any of the pen testers listening, where can they find it? Yeah, so the first and the foremost reason, uh, when I started this Learn 365 uh, Day Challenge, the first topic that I pick, uh, picked up was this two-factor authentication bypass because you will see two-factor authentication almost at every newly developed application uh, these days, whether you are doing bug bounties or pen testing. So it's it's really a nice attack vector to look around that you can uh, you know create an impactful bug. Now, uh, when I started posting it on the Twitter, it, it the thread was like really long. It like took around 20 to 25 tweets to just totally put up the things. So the idea was was to uh, you know collab uh, collaborate every uh, piece of information into a single thing then i started to uh, like work about like okay which service i can use or what is uh, the option to create a mind map now uh, i can utilize this particular mind map to go and uh, see okay uh, hey Harsh, you have exhausted five methods to perform 2fa bypass still there are five more left go and try it but usually if you are not having something in front of your uh, say desk or if you are not having something in just you know top of the head something is not easy uh, to access for you at the moment you might get lost as you mentioned uh, between you know uh, doing a lot of things because as a pen tester, sometimes the time is a constraint. You have to be time bounded to, you know, make sure that you cover each and every uh, test case on that application. 
having a mind map uh, will allow you to you know uh, focusly work on a particular test case say two effect bypass techniques so you you know that okay i have like tried almost 10 techniques these are the uh, most of the techniques which one can try and if you are finding something new it's 11 technique which you can go and add for your next mentor uh, and the second reason was to you know the community collaborate and add their experience as well so uh, when some good chunk of people see that hey somebody just posted something really interesting to help out the people and i know that there is one more vector which is missing and I can go and add. Some people even suggested to add and we added some more attack vectors to it. Now we have a good collection of uh, attack vectors or uh, kind of, you know, testing methodology that we can perform on two-factor authentications. So yeah, uh, this was the uh, main goal. Uh, there are multiple places you can right now go and find out. Uh, you can go to MindVazor and search for this 2FA bypass techniques. Uh, you can go to Cobalt's blog. We have a dedicated blog explaining uh, most of the techniques, uh, most of the important techniques that how not only just uh, see that what are the ways, but you can also uh, look and see that how we bypass that, the kind of steps and uh, kind of methodologies also uh, written on the Cobalt's blog. So you can, I guess, go to blog.cobalt.io and check that out. Yeah, absolutely. For the listeners listening, you can go to cobalt.io uh, forward slash blog and it's, it's over there. Um, and then I love how you said you added it or you put it out so that, you know, not only to give back, but to also, you know, you understood that you might have missed something, right? So you put yeah. it out there so that the community can add to it. And um, I think that's that's amazing because, you know, a lot of times, even when people put uh, their tools out there, they don't want anybody to like add to it. They want it to be theirs. And so when you're allowing the community to build it out, um, and create this, you know, essentially a roadmap that you can use to test 2FA with. Because um, we want to make sure that we're, you know, challenging every single control, every single, um, you know, asset, whatever it is that we're doing during a pen test. And we want to make sure that we have, you know, essentially like a checklist, which is this is what it's kind of acting as, right? It's a it's a checklist with a, with a map of what we need to do at every yeah. certain point. Um, you know, as a web app pen tester, we, or when we're doing web app pen testing, we use the OWASP top 10, right? We use that as kind of like a checklist of what we have to go down. And then we can use mind maps, such as the one that you created to help us dig more into the weeds of each uh, bullet point in the top 10. Um, so it's amazing. That's amazing. Um, and so with that, um, what are some of the tips that you would, uh, you would highlight that, can prevent and uh, and remediate any of these kinds of issues that pen testers such as you and I would exploit during a pen test when targeting 2FA? Yeah, so uh, the first uh, solution is to make sure that the validations are properly checked. Like, you know, if I am uh, uh, like manipulating the response to uh, change the form field or something like that, I am just providing any OTP or something like that. So most of the attacks in this web application pen test domain, not only just 2FA, you know, can be mitigated if you are implementing the proper validation checks, if you are sanitizing the input or uh, validating everything at the proper places. Uh, secondly, if you are implementing access controls and authorization checks in place, so one cannot bypass, say, you are on the 2FA screen and you are directly hitting, say, my account page or you are uh, bypassing based on refer check, so you can mitigate against those issues. Uh, thirdly, implement a more obscure and like, you know, a more complex uh, OTP or 2FA method, like you're using six to eight digit of uh, OTP with uh, alphanumerics or using some special character within it. So adding more complexity will reduce the or uh, chances to get it cracked and will uh, require an attacker to basically uh, add more computational power to it. Uh, then make sure that the functionalities like OTP, PIN and things like that or any kind of 2FA are secured with proper brute forcing uh, protection and proper you know rate limiting checks. And if you have all these things in the place, uh, most of your infrastructure is secure, but still uh, pen testers are you know really crazy to dig around new ideas. So I hope that uh, these things will secure, but uh, there might be some other bypasses that you should keep on looking for, keep on, you know, even I suggest that the blue teamers or the uh, developers should be also engaging with the InfoSec community to see that how we people are going about, uh, you know, bypassing the mitigations that they are develop uh, they, they are putting, right? So I, I feel like the hackers mostly, you know, sneak peek into the developer community to see that how they are, uh, you know, putting some mitigations, but at the same time, developers might not be, you know, uh, doing the same to see that how we are bypassing those mitigations. 
applications. So yeah, uh, if you two will collaborate together, then you know the software industry and this infosec industry is going to be next level. Like, sure. I love how you say hackers sneak into the development pipelines or into the de into where the devs are. You see what they're doing. Very hacker esque. Not to be confused, hacking still not a crime, as uh, Hirsch had yeah. mentioned. You know, there's a difference between cyber cyber criminal activity and being a hacker, right? And you know, if you're a hacker and you're working for an internal company and you go to see what your dev department is doing, that's not anything illegal. So that's just part of you know what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to challenge everything within the organization. Um, so yeah, but no, I, I I love that, and I think that's one of the you know awesome things that a lot of pen testing services, especially like Cobalt, are, are doing is where we're putting that offensive security mindset or that challenging hacker mindset, even at the developer level, right? Where we're working yeah. with yeah. Um, with developers in like a CI CD pipeline or, or a DevOps pipeline. And like, actually not, it's not about putting the offensive security mindset in the pipeline, but about putting that challenging, hey, let's see what we don't know kind of mindset and explore that. Um, so yeah, awesome. that's true. Like yeah, that's true. Like when you when you know uh, like even when I work at the various project at the Cobalt, even like at my current projects, right? So we get a chance to interact with their DevOps team or their engineering team, which gives us more insight that how sometimes we can exploit a particular scenario. So uh, it's it's more of a collaborative approach when devs and the security team are collaborating together. It's it's like less less painful, you know, for both of the parties. Otherwise, if both parties will work, uh, you know, uh, like in a different manner, it will be a pain uh, somewhere. You know, uh, there will be a big gap between understanding the security issues and things like that. So this is this is really one of the best thing that I feel uh, while working at the Cobalt that uh, the kind of collaboration that we have is, is the key of everything. 100%, man, 100%. Well, we're uh, we're starting to come to a wrap here. So, you know, to, to kind of conclude everything, we've, we've talked a lot about a lot of different things around two-factor authentication, um, especially, you know, sharing some of your research, some of some your, you know, examples that you've came up in your real world uh, pen testing career. Um, but if you had to like conclude it all, what are like the main takeaways that you would want to advise everyone from everything that we've we've talked about? Yeah, so the first and the foremost thing is never stop tinkering around the things because you don't know that when you are going to, you know, find out a bypass for something. Uh, because uh, usually people make a mindset that, hey, there are 10 methods. Now there cannot be an 11th method, but it, there, there would not be like any 11th method unless you will go and try to find it, right? So just keep on like digging around the things, keep on like looking at the things. Uh, be, like be active in learning something new at least uh, give uh, half an hour to one hour daily to you know uh, you can see that uh, it will make a difference out of everything uh, specifically talking about 2FA bypass make sure that uh, next time when you sit for a pen test or a bug bounty target you use the mind map or uh, the blog read the blog and maybe it will help you out to uh, reach uh, some good uh, you know uh, security issue for you or your customer or something like that uh, ultimately uh, Make sure that whenever you are writing a report for 2FA or anything specifically, just make sure that the remediation that you are providing are specific to that scenario because that's really important aspect, uh, in, specifically in pen test that uh, we do not provide generic remediation, rather we tend to provide like a remediation which suits the particular scenario of the issue. Awesome. Yeah. I wrote down, keep calm and tinker on. <laughs> And stay curious and um, and make sure that when you're, yeah, when you're, when you're in your pen test uh, engagements and you're, you're sitting there having to go through, you know, the, the list of things that you need to check off, make sure that you cover the, the whole basis, right? Because you might miss something. And, you know, yeah. we as pen testers, sometimes we get lost in the weeds and we forget that, hey, we also, we, we, we need, we have a job to do and we got to check everything. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Um, it's a, as a pen tester, you know, you you got to check everything in a very time bounded manner. So yeah, having checklists handy and having you know a list of sets of things that you already know is is really fruitful. Yeah, time boundaries that's a big thing for any of the pen testers or one of the uh, inspiring or I'm sorry, aspiring uh, cyber pen testing enthusiasts is that uh, you know cyber criminals have an unlo uh, unlimited amount of time. We don't, so we have to make yeah. sure that we spend our time um you know we we're very cognitive about the time that we have to to uh use on an engagement and that we also make sure that we make the best use of it so yeah. 
Um, so thanks again, Hirsch, for being on the show. Um, for everyone that wants to uh, reach out to Hirsch, we'll make sure that all of his information is put in the show notes and that you can see his blog out on the Cobalt blog. Again, we'll make sure that all that stuff is in the show notes. And um, thanks again, everyone, for listening this week. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you, everyone. Hi there. Thanks for listening to Pentester Diaries, a podcast brought to you by Cobalt.io. We hope you enjoyed and welcome you to subscribe, share, or leave a review wherever you tune in from. You can catch more episodes by following Cobalt on LinkedIn and Twitter. Stay tuned for more episodes.